Okay, well, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the uh, Institute for Global Health Sciences Grand Rounds. I'm uh, George Rutherford. I'm the uh, acting executive director of the Institute for Global Health Sciences. It's a true pleasure uh, today to have Dr. Yvonne Maldonado uh, join us from Stanford. Uh, she'll be speaking on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic-driven changes and addressing the global burden of disease in a pediatric uh, perspective. Uh, Dr. Maldonado is an old colleague of mine, not old, and just going far, but long, far back. She's the Taub Professor of Global Health and Infectious Diseases, a professor of pediatrics and of epidemiology and population health, and chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford, where she's also the Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity. She attends the Stanford University School of Medicine and uh, Pediatric and Pediatric Infectious Disease Fellowship at Johns Hopkins. She served in the Public Health Service uh, in the Epidemi Epidemiology Intelligence Service uh, and received the Alexander Langmuir Prize uh, named for the founder of EIS. Uh, she has led uh, NIH, CDC, USA, Gates Foundation and WHO funded domestic and international pediatric vaccine and perinatal HIV infection studies in the US, India, Mexico, and Africa. She leads several COVID-19 clinical epidemiology and laboratory studies and epidemiologic modeling uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at Stanford and at the state and national level. She's the chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Diseases, a council member of the National Institute of, on Child Health and Human Development, uh, a member of the Infectious Disease Society of America, uh, the Society for Pediatric Research, the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society, Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, and the American Public Health Association. She's the uh, liaison to the U U.S. Public Health Services Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. This is from her AAP role, uh, and a previous member of the Board of Scientific Counselors um, for the Office of Infectious Diseases for the for CDC and uh, the Board of Pediatrics Infectious Disease Society. She's published over 250 peer-reviewed articles, we have probably five in common, and is co-editor of the textbooks Remington and Klein's uh, Infectious Diseases of the Fetus and Newborn Infant and the Report of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Diseases, better known as the Red Book. Uh, so it's a delight to introduce Dr. Maldonado. Let me also introduce Franny Kincaid, who is a master's student here at UCSF. Um, Franny is a graduate of Indiana University uh, and uh, where she majored in biology and she'll be leading the, uh, the Q&A when we're done. So let me turn it over to Dr. Maldonado. Bonnie, thank you so much for doing this and I definitely owe you one. In front of all these people, I'm going to say that. So oh, thank you. Take well, it away. Thank you. Thanks. George and I have, uh, George was my mentor when I was a young uh, new epidemiologist, so I owe him a lot as well. So let me go ahead and get started. Uh, um, I know we are short on time and, I, and there's a lot to cover, but I did uh, want to talk a little bit about the intersection of my own interests and probably the interests of a lot of you out there, which is um, how did COVID-19 really drive challenges in addressing global burden of disease? And then I'm gonna talk about pediatrics and spe specifically in, in, as well. So I uh, here are my disclosures. And I just think context is critical. Um, this is a little slide that I found from a, a Wikipedia website somewhere, but it just shows you from the time, from in the last 2000 years, these little poofs on the left show you that we've had a number of pandemics over those 2000 years. This is not the biggest pandemic we've seen in terms of raw numbers. And even in absolute numbers, you can imagine that this is the, our current pandemic's pale in comparison. And if you look on the right, the death tolls are actually also much higher, say for example, for the black death, for smallpox um, and, um, uh, and, and other diseases. So um, as I, I'm not to, not to trivialize what we're going through right now, but uh, humanity has faced other pandemics. And fortunately with our technology and our knowledge of epidemiology and po policy, we should be able to um, address these um, as we um, as we uh, move further along in our understanding of this virus and its impact. So I'm going to talk a bit about 
how we measure global health and why we measure it. Um, you probably all know some of this, but I wanted us to all get on a global, on a level playing field. Some of the simplest measures are the best ones because we need to level the expectations of understanding global health at its very basic and core level across many different societies that have different access to infrastructure and resources. So we measure births and we measure deaths. Those are the easiest things to measure. And even with that, with 194 countries around the world, we know that many countries can't accurately even measure these, but that is where we start. Um, and unfortunately, death and births um, as uh, tragic as deaths are, it's some of the easiest ways to start addressing how we can improve global health. Um, economic conditions are important to measure as well, such as income employment type, employment rate, social conditions such as literacy, access to clean water, sanitation and medical care are all critical. And then finally, biological conditions, you know, which we always think about as important for global health are actually important, but not as important as the things that I mentioned above, because we really need to set the overall context of the biological conditions within each uh, country's region and country's capacity to deal with them. So these are the general ways we measure. Um, and we have a project that was started by the World Health Organization in 1990 called the Global Burden of Disease Project. Um, it has now been taken over by IHME, the Institute of Health Metrics Evaluation, in uh, Washington State, and they really have taken this measure on and they published many data around it. I'm gonna show you a little bit about it, but it does give us a snapshot on global health and where we are so that we can continue to improve. Now, when we talk about key indicators of child health, um, we look at other things in addition to what I just showed you, and that is maternal mortality rate, neonatal mortality rate, infant mortality rate, under five mortality rate, and stunting, as well as children living in absolute poverty. Now, these are all, again, very hard to measure, especially in areas that need these measurements the most, but we do go in around the world as investigators and try to make sure we understand some of these rates. And what we found is that even within lower and middle income countries, which have the biggest burden, as you'll see, there are regional aspects to this. That is some areas that have um, better outcomes and worse outcomes. And if you don't understand the data, you can't address the problem. So it is really critical to do this. And I'll show you why it's important to measure these all separately, um, because they don't all measure the same thing. And the causes in each of these categories is very different. So let me back up again and talk about key facts about global mortality. Um, and again, measure using this as a measure of overall global health. Now imagine a diverse group of international individuals that represent everybody in the world. So if we took a thousand people and we made them representative of every, every uh, all of the 8 billion people in the world, um, and, and then look at the, those thousand people who died in 2012, where we have really uh, very granular data. Of those thousand people, 13% would have come from low-income countries, 35% from lower middle-income countries, 30% from upper middle-income countries, and 20% uh, from high-income countries. So it seems reasonably distributed. I mean, it, you know, you would think that most of the deaths would come from the lower-income countries. However, we also have to think about other issues such as density of population, et cetera. And we also remember this is mortality, not morbidity. So there may be chronic diseases that impact some countries more than others. So this is kind of a general picture of where mortality is, but let me dig deeper as well. So you can see here, 14% of the deaths in the world will have been in children under 15 years of age whereas 40% would be 15 to 69 year olds and 45% in people 70 and older. Imagine if 15% of children, of 14% of children in the US under 15 died every year. That would be an immediate um, uh, measure for us to stop. And yet we tolerate this uh, every single year in the world because um, these are people who are essentially invisible at the global scale. Now, if you look at the Global Burden of Disease program from 2012, you can see overall, and this is by way of showing what, it, what are people dying of, because this is one way to say, where should we put our dollars and our efforts? 
to prevent death. You can see that the leading causes of death overall are not infectious. They are ischemic heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and other issues. Now you will see that there are things like lower respiratory infections, primarily influenza, um, HIV and diarrheal diseases, but most of these are not infectious diseases. Um, but if you look at um, causes of death by uh, type of country, so low income, lower middle income, upper middle income, and high income countries, and sorry, I know these are this is a very busy slide, but trust me when I tell you that when you look at the lower income countries, the top causes are lower respiratory infections, again, mostly influenza, but other things like pneumococcal disease, et cetera, HIV AIDS, diarrhea, um, and includes malaria, TB, and um, other essentially preventable causes. So uh, we, we do see that as you move into the higher tiered countries, we are facing more chronic diseases, but our lower and lower middle income countries are still facing relatively um, uh, preventable diseases. Um, and if you look overall at the estimated deaths, this is from a paper um, that was published some years ago, looking at the estimated deaths in 2002 and projected deaths in 2030, you can see that um, the estimated deaths um, in uh, projected deaths in 2030, and this was before COVID, of course, looked like we were going to have a drop off um, in uh, younger ages, but that they would rise in older populations. Um, and so we will have to see what the numbers look like when we're through this pandemic and we have a better sense of disease, but certainly this is likely not going to happen um, given the COVID uh, pandemic. Now, this is another slide from that same paper, which really outlines uh, what we call group one, group two, and group three causes of death. Group one is primarily communicable, maternal, perinatal, and nutritionally related deaths. Group two is non-communicable, and group three are injuries. And you can see over time that the group one deaths have really dropped off in general, um, uh, but we have seen a relative increase, an absolute increase in group two and group three causes of death over time. That is in some ways a good sign that we're addressing the preventable diseases, but now we have to start thinking about training um, our global workforce, not only to prevent disease and death, but to deal with complications of non-commutable and chronic illnesses for which we are not prepared in the global workforce. So let's come back to global child mortality. About two thirds of child deaths are preventable. 80% of under five deaths in 2012 occurred in 25 countries, half of these in five countries alone. A child's risk of dying, I'll show you this in a bit, is highest in the first month of life, with nearly 3 million children in 2011 dying within a month of their birth. Pneumonia, and this is, by the way, not even taking into account stillbirths, which still to this day are not well recorded. Pneumonia is the single largest cause of death in children under five, and diarrheal diseases are leading causes of sickness and death still um, in children in developing countries. So looking at child deaths, this is a really telling graphic um, from our world in data. And you can see that um, when you look at deaths from 1990 to 2017, oh, and I'll show you a different graphic here. With, with the Millennium Development Goals from the, uh, the um, United Nations and the World Health Organization and others, um, we were able to uh, focus on reducing deaths, preventable deaths. And we did go from over 12 and a half million deaths in 1990 to um, about uh, a, a little over five and a half million deaths in 2017. So a major reduction. But you can see uh, very quickly that the deaths in the first year of life really did not drop off as much as we would have liked. And in fact, the deaths in the first month of life has essentially remained static. And if you look at a more complex slide from IHME, um, and our world and data, you can see when you break this down by age groups and causes of death, there are many different causes, but it, you can see in the bolded letters that infections continue to dominate a lot of these areas, preterm births and neonatal asphyxia and trauma, which are also preventable with good prenatal and perinatal care, as well as help in birthing practices. So a lot of these are still preventable, simple causes. 
obviously not easy to address, but they are preventable. Um, and infectious diseases continue to play a big role. And by the way, in all of these deaths, about half of them are somewhat related in one way or another to malnutrition. So we still have a nutritional component to a lot of these causes of death. Now, um, what about vaccines? So we know that in the last uh, several years that using uh, these nine vaccines here, we've at least been able to eliminate 3 million deaths a year in children. We could do even more with additional vaccines that are now available through Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations and other organizations as well. And you can imagine when we look at the distribution of child deaths, um, the usual actors are, are in play and that is that Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia continue to represent a lot of the child deaths. Now, remember, we're just measuring the minimum, not uh, infections, we're talking about deaths. So this is the extreme example. Surely, as you all know, we can do a better job of immunizing children around the world and I'll show you some data around that as well. And again, coming back to mortality over time, I think it's really important to showcase the fact that we were able to reduce deaths uh, because we were very proactive and very uh, strategic about focusing on vaccinations and other methods. And you see here 12.6 million children died in 1990 um, uh, and reduced that to 5.4 million uh, by 2017 and by age group. Um, but over uh, 30 days of age. So really the kids, the new, newborns have really had the least impact. And we can see that millions of deaths could be averted if regional and county country disparities were eliminated. So if we had regional equity, we could eliminate another 4.4 million deaths and global equity would, would reduce that number even further. So um, and what we mean by equity would be addressing a lot of the factors um, that are causes of death, such as uh, lack of vaccination, lack of prenatal care, lack of perinatal care, um, and addressing malnutrition in children and pregnant women and children around the world. Um, I had already showed you that, again, disparities in regional areas are also uh, uh, really um, heterogeneous, even from one country to another within a country. So in some countries, you'll have very high rates of um, survival and other air pockets where things are much worse. And of course, during these times of COVID, I'll show you a little bit about what we know so far, but it's only exacerbated these disparities in access to infrastructure and support. So worldwide, the contribution of different risk factors to disease burden has changed overall from risk for communicable diseases in children to those non-communicable diseases in adults, I would argue as well that um, non-communicable diseases in kids have also grown um, in needs because a lot of children who otherwise would have died are now surviving but may have morbidity impacts that, for which we don't have a well-trained pediatric workforce. Um, so um, the key risks now are um, unimproved water and sanitation, uh, vitamin deficiencies, ambient particulate matter, uh, pollution, and climate change issues, which are, of course, highly challenging and, and, and highly burdensome. So um, we, you know, in 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted. Um, there's uh, 17 of them. They don't really directly address health except for number three, which is good health and well-being, but really the idea is to provide a holistic approach to health, including uh, families, hunger, uh, education, gender equality, water uh, and sanitation, um, energy, um, economic and in industrial infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainability, climate action, et cetera. So very aspirational goals that we think we must maintain in order to really keep our, our countries around the world and our regions around the world uh, looking forward to maintaining not only a reduction in childhood deaths, but an improvement 
in life, life course, improvement in overall health rather than just reducing deaths. And then what happened is, this is a, a book that I would encourage many of you, all of you to read if you get a chance. It's a short book. It's written by a former um, CDC um, employee who actually worked quite a lot on the, uh, was one of the leaders of the smallpox eradication effort. It's, the book is called House on Fire. Um, and it's the fight to eradicate smallpox. And the reason I like this book, I'll, I'll first read you the quote. If a house is on fire, no one wastes time putting water on nearby houses just in case the fire spreads. They rush to pour water where it will do most good on the burning house. So we know now where the burning house is. And the question is, are we going to continue to waste the water or are we going to pour it on the burning house? And Bill Fagey talked about this when he looked at smallpox eradication. And this is actually not a quote from him. It was from one of his Indian colleagues who was helping him strategize on how to address smallpox. Um, and so, as you know, we were successful with a global effort to eradicate smallpox. We need to take the same effort and uh, a will, political and other will, uh, when we deal with COVID because COVID is another house on fire that has not only raised issues around um, how our healthcare and our public health systems are working, but on racial, ethnic, and other health, health disparities and how we deal with those. So this is a real call to action for us to really start to address those houses that have been on fire for many, many decades, and we just haven't spent time thinking about them. So let's come back and talk specifically about coronavirus. As you all know, it's quite widespread um, in terms of death and disease, but just to get, this is from, I think this is World Mapper. Yeah, this is World Mapper. So I wanna compare and contrast what's happened. This um, slide on the left is from a year ago. And then here on the right, you can see where we are now. So um, this is COVID-19 cases per capita. And you see that the um, many cases, the global South was primarily affected. But look what's happened uh, just in the last year uh, in, since we, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic to now, we're seeing that um, the cases have really gone up around the world. So even in high income countries, um, the, the Western hemisphere, we are seeing more cases. I couldn't find a rates per capita, but as you probably all know, the per capita rates in the US are some of the highest in the world and surely the highest among highly developed countries. So we have not done a good job, even in our own backyard, in maintaining good public health policies and practices that that have been in that have been actually we've we've built the policies and practices, but they have not been implemented uh, in many way, in many reasons, uh, for many reasons because, but one in particular, because our uh, system of healthcare is so fragmented based on state and county mandates rather than federal regulations. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it that way, but we haven't had a unified policy approach to COVID. But you can see that we have had cases all around the world as well. And um, clearly a devastating uh, disease everywhere. Now, when you look at deaths, um, the, uh, uh, as of June 2021, you could see that the Global South, again, was disproportionately affected and continues to be on the right. But now we've seen um, uh, our share here in the US with us having uh, some of the, I think, if not the largest, some of the largest death rates around the world. And I say that because while our numbers are larger, there's, I suspect there's a big undercount in other countries. But be that as it may, we have really, um, we are just in the same boat as our global partners in the Global South in terms of our ability to um, utilize our infrastructure to address COVID or lack of it. So now um, I don't wanna spend time talking about COVID. I'm sure you've had many opportunities to do that. What I wanted to do is talk about other impacts of COVID on children. And obviously the biggest marker of infrastructure support for kids has always been, how do we deal with pediatric vaccines? And in July of 2021, we saw that global vaccine coverage dropped overall in the world from 86% to 83%. Now that doesn't seem like a big drop, um, but um, that means that an estimated 23 million kids under the age of one did not receive basic vaccines, which is the highest number since 2009. 
In 2020, the number of completely unvaccinated children increased by 3.4 million. Only 19 vaccine introductions were reported in uh, countries, in, especially in lower and middle income countries. In 2020, less than half of any year in the past two decades. And this is another chronic issue here. 1.6 million more girls were not fully protected against HPV in 2020 compared to the previous year. Now, this is an interesting um, fact that I think people overlook, but in fact, uh, cervical cancer is one of the top five causes of death in women around the world. So the fact that we are seeing reductions in HPV vaccine is especially tragic because in 10 or 20 years, we're gonna see an epidemic of women with cervical cancer deaths um, that have, where we've already had a, a major problem already. So this is particularly poignant because these are, um, this is access to a very straightforward ability to prevent a cancer death. And um, this is only gonna get worse during the pandemic period. Now, this was data that was shared with uh, me by George. So I thought it was really exciting to be able to include it here. But this is an analysis from a company called Avalara. And they took previous analyses, which compared um, US federal, this is the US. So I just talked about global, this is US based data. And this, what you're seeing here is that um, this, uh, this company took ACIP or federally, federal government related recommended vaccinations from January, of no, January through November of 2020 to the same months in 2019. So pre versus post pandemic across all claims. So these are claims data, people who ask for payment. It's, the, it's really the best way to measure global vaccination utilization is who asks for payment for vaccines that were administered. And this is important because it's not only um, public data, but it's also private data. So commercial um, providers as well as federal providers. And you can see over time that the, uh, the important thing here is to see that over time, the number of claims actually has dropped off, especially in 2021. So that means that less people are asking for reimbursement. And that means that essentially we're missing a lot of vaccinations. And it declined, the decline translated into an estimated 26 million missed doses of recommended vaccines. Um, and so um, then you can see that the data um, uh, summary here shows that routine immunizations will continue to lag in 2021 um, and that we are going to see um, many lower um, vaccinated children, but also adults. And this will lead to um, potential for outbreaks of measles, pertussis, um, and other diseases in the US. Um, we can only imagine that this is gonna happen as well in developing settings. Um, so this is a message that I work on uh, with my colleagues at the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as other global organizations to try to make sure we enhance immunization opportunities. So what about indirect impacts of COVID-19 on children? These are things we generally can't measure well, but I think it, it, we have a number of smaller studies that are starting to understand that some of the impacts include incredible worsening of mental or emotional health among all age groups, but especially among our children under 18, widening of existing educational gaps, decreased physical activity and increased body mass index, which can also lead to medical conditions such as diabetes and other diseases, decreased healthcare utilization, routine immunization decreases, increase in adverse child experiences, and loss of caregivers. So many, many impacts that uh, we can't really, we've been measuring in small bits and pieces, but we still don't have a good handle on what these numbers are gonna mean to this generation. In some ways, I feel like this is a reflection of what happened with the HIV pandemic, where um, that affected our 20 to 45 year olds, that primarily affected a large group that was our economic workforce. But what we're seeing here is even worse, I think, because this um, pandemic is affecting our future economic workforce and the ability of, of societies all around the world to be able to build up with the, the, the youngest and brightest um, and really giving an opportunity 
to uh, turn to go be, to be go ahead and be, become the leaders in the next ten to twenty years. So let me um, spend a little bit of time talking about the Gates Foundation Goal Goalkeepers Report. Their general reflections. If you want to, you should go to this Goalkeepers Report. It's kind of helpful. They have nice pictures and it's fairly straightforward to read. There, I'm going to pull some uh, quotes from the 2020 report as well as from the 2021 report. So some of their overall observations obviously were major backsliding and percentage of children around the world getting essential vaccinations with food insecurity on the rise. And unfortunately, one of the biggest areas of impact was in extreme poverty. Remember, we talked about the Millennium Development Goals. And one of the amazing things about the Millennium Development Goals, which ended in 2000, um, uh, sorry, 2015, was that we were able to reduce uh, an extreme poverty around the world by a huge percentage. Um, and all of that was lost during the pandemic. So the first pa six months of the pandemic uh, saw the number of people living in extreme poverty rise by 7% after huge declines for the last two decades. So in September of 2020, the appraisal was, in other words, we've been set back about 25 years and 25 weeks. Think about what the, what the impact is gonna be now two, two, more than two years into this pandemic. This is an example from 2020 of the projected numbers of under five deaths. So you can see in the red, that would be the worst case scenario that is uh, under five deaths going up. And the uh, lower bar there showing where we had hoped to be. Um, and, we, um, I'll sh and we, again, don't know where we are at this point, um, but we certainly aren't at the worst case scenario, but we're somewhere between that and our ideal. But it's certainly, we certainly know that the pandemic has led to a, re uh, a reduction in these efforts, not necessarily just because of the pandemic impacts on child deaths, but on the economic impacts on children's caregivers and the environment in which they grow up, which has led to less support of these children. Um, we uh, estimated by the end of 2021 to have lost $12 trillion in the global economy. I'm sure the number is much higher than that. Um, the global economy was losing 500 billion a year every single month. Um, and um, almost every axis of inequity, as we spoke about before, um, on everyone, uh, impacted every one of those dimensions. And again, this is where I talked about the house on fire, where the pandemic infectious issues are important, but the overall axis of inequity is even more glaring. So let's look again at progress um, here. Um, all of our global development metrics have been reduced uh, progress in 2020. Um, and we think we are irretrievably off course to hit most of our goals even by 2030. And as a good example, 2020 vaccination coverage is at levels last seen 30 years ago. So we've lost lots of ground. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about global vaccination status here to show you our best case scenario was overall 92% coverage. Worst case scenario was estimated to be 75% coverage. I'll update that for, any, for you in a second. This was from 2020. And here what we see in, 20, uh, in 20, uh, 21, the goalkeeper report and the IHME estimated that the, they had estimated that the vaccination coverage would drop by 14 percentage points. And in fact, what we saw um, was still unfortunate, but, that, but the amount of reduction was only about half of that at 7%. And we do see a nice rebound. So we think that we're getting back to some semblance of normality around the world. But of course, as you know, with all of the global um, uh, displacements, uh, refugees and, and, and migrations and lack of infrastructure, um, that is very heterogeneous around the world, but still, um, a little bit of good news. We didn't lose as much immunization coverage as we thought we would. So what are global immunization next steps? Well, some of these are restoring services so countries can deliver, uh, safely deliver routine immunization and are still supplying safety and PPE to these health workers, helping them communicate actively to caregivers, rectifying coverage and immunity gaps, which WHO and UNICEF and others have been doing a remarkable job. I mean, they are really on the ground in all of these countries trying to rectify these gaps. 
and then expanding routine services to reach missed communities. Honestly, if we could do this for polio, um, we should be able to expand those kinds of missed opportunities for all vaccinations and all pediatric and maternal services. But as we said before, there are areas that are difficult to measure, such as loss of educational opportunities and mental health impacts. And those are areas where I think we're going to need to continue to study and not only study, but uh, have a rapid response in terms of abilities for public policy and public health to really come in and start to shore up these areas where children are really suffering, our literacy rates, our mental health issues, that not only are children in our um, high income countries uh, being affected, but certainly uh, in the global South. So what about pandemic mitigation? Um, the mitigation by a global commitment to equitably share COVID-19 vaccines. And of course, this is when they become available and that's a problem. This was a slide I still keep even though it's old because we said we do have lots of vaccines, but we know, for example, in Africa, only 11% of, of individuals in Africa are fully vaccinated. And as you saw recently, Johnson & Johnson um, um, and it has started to reduce their production of vaccination of vaccines, and they're not sharing those vaccines um, in areas where they promised and committed that they would share them in the global south in particular. So we're seeing a uh, we're still not seeing availability of vaccines around the world. Half as many people would die from COVID-19 if the first billion doses of vaccine, for example, uh, had been equitably shared rather than snapped up by rich countries. Um, an impact on healthcare delivery systems could be rectified in the near term, but as we've seen already, economic da damage to developing economies will take much longer to repair. Um, and I um, wanted to show you uh, this slide, which I took from um, the website there from Nature back in August of 2020. This was before we had any vaccine availability. And I think this is a really interesting approach because what you see here, is vaccines that were committed, already purchased or committed before we even knew the results of any of the vaccine trials for any, any vaccines that had, were being studied in August of 2020, if you can remember that far back. And what you see here is that the supply of vaccinations were going, remember we only need between one and two doses at this time, right? We thought two doses per capita. You can see who was already promised to get them. It was the UK, the US, the European Union, Japan, Vietnam, Australia, et cetera. And LMICs and COVAX in particular were getting nothing. Um, we are still seeing that COVAX has gotten some share. I think uh, we've seen globally that there have been about 10 billion doses of vaccine distributed around the world, which is a great number, given that we have 8 billion people in the world. But about 33 of the countries in the world of the 194 countries have had less than 10% of their populations vaccinated and another 33 or so have less than 40% 40 of their populations vaccinated. So we're talking about uh, a, a large share of countries in the world that don't have adequate vaccination because they don't have supply. And we're talking about two years into the pandemic now. So we've had time to distribute. Um, and this is another slide from the Kaiser Family Foundation showing vaccine doses purchased uh, recently by income level compared to share of the global adult population. And you can see that high income countries make up 19% of the global adult population, and yet that we have 54% of the doses just purchased. So um, I use vaccine equity uh, as an example of overall equity. This is clearly the house on fire approach here. But if we can't even get vaccines out, what are we doing about infrastructure for all of the other issues that are less visible? So clearly there's a lot of work to be done here. So vaccine re equity requires one or more highly effective vaccines. We have that. Manufacturing billions of doses, we have that. Financing to distribute and implement, that's been a problem. Um, and reduce transmission. Um, and, to bring an end in 2022, well, we'll see if that happens. Uh, obviously, we're not going to end um, circulation of the virus, but whether we can end the pandemic uh, and turn it into an endemic, we'll see. That's a challenge for this year. 
But clearly the third bullet point is the problem. COVAX has been supported to a certain extent, but has faced obstacles all along the way. So um, we know overall, when we uh, just look at who is at most risk overall of um, global health uh, burdens, children under the age of five are at most risk. Um, in many ways, global progress has been made in reducing child deaths since 1990. We already saw that they re uh, deaths reduced by 58% from 1990 to 2017. 15,000 deaths every day, which is still a large number compared with 34,000 in 1990. The world as a whole is accelerating progress in reducing under five mortality, but there are still major disparities we know that Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest under five mortality rate in the world. And in 2017 alone, before the pandemic, four and a half million deaths could have been averted under five um, if we had the infrastructure and support for those countries. Um, uh, we talked again about the fact that most half of under five child deaths are due to diseases that are preventable and treatable through simple, affordable interventions. That strengthening health systems to provide interventions will not only save young lives, but are building the economic and political futures of our world. We know that when we lose this workforce, um, we destabilize countries and economies and the political systems that they support. So it's really an, a, a political uh, uh, imperative as well to save these young lives. And then malnourishment is a clear undercurrent in about half of all deaths around the world. So let me just spend a couple of minutes here talking about some overall frameworks. This is the PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization conceptual framework um, on health equity. I, there's a WHO one as well, but I really like the PAHO concept for a couple of reasons that I'll explain in a bit. So this is a higher, higher level. How do we deal with health inequities? One of the things that we look at at the very top there is intersectionality. We need to remember that social and economic equities inequities are important across many different spheres, including gender, sexuality, ethnicity, disability, and migration. Structural drivers of these inequities include political, social, cultural, and economic structures. Some of these are institutionalized racism, for example, which we need to acknowledge so that we can start to deconstruct those. Natural environment, land, and climate change are important. This is one of the areas that PAHO focuses on, which WHO does not give as much emphasis to. Um, and the other one that PAHO focuses on, which we have not seen WHO focus on specifically, is the history and legacy of ongoing colonialism and structural racism. If we don't address these issues, we are going to continue down paths using um, false um, assumptions about how to correct problems. We need to deconstruct the systems that are creating inequities to begin with. Now, all of these structural drivers then lead to conditions of daily life uh, that affect everything from early life and education to working life, older individuals, income and social protection, violence, environment and housing and health systems. And improving these can lead to health equity and dignified life. Now, how we get there sounds very simple, but obviously is complex, but it involves taking action either locally or by governance and by uh, focusing on human rights. So this is a really nice conceptual framework. Of course, it needs to uh, be um, taken to the local level, the country level, and even um, the regional levels as well. And I think all of us can do a part in trying to start to address one or more of these areas. Now, let me end with a couple of slides that talk about some ways to measure these issues. And we're trying to do some studies now to look at social vulnerability. Um, social vulnerability indices, um, there are many of them. I'm just gonna high showcase one. And the way you use these are basically, uh, this, this particular one was developed by CDC to identify communities that need support before, during, and after public health emergencies. It's been around for a long time. You can go to the website down below or just Google CDC SVI and you'll find a website. It has a lot of data. This is an open access data set where you can use a measure of social determinants of health by using US census data, which is not only census tract driven, but zip code driven. 
and it ranks each county and census tract on 15 vulnerability factors and groups them into four related themes, socioeconomics, housing composition and disability, representation of racial and ethnic minority groups and housing and transportation. And using this particular census tract approach, you can actually map out where high vulnerable versus low vulnerable uh, communities are around the country for a particular uh, area of interest. And doing that, um, you can start to then address and tease apart within each of those regions, where are the most vulnerable, uh, what are the most vulnerable factors and how can you start to address them as a local or a state or even national public health organization. And let me give you just one brief example here. Um, so this is looking, this is from early on, so September of 2020, looking at on the left, a map of the social vulnerability index and you can see the most uh, at risk indices in the dark blue and the least in the light in the white or light blue on the left. On the right, you see COVID-19 cases during that time per 100,000 residents. And you can see that introduction of this virus happened in those areas that had highest overall vulnerability indices. And if you look at the data, I don't have time to show it now, you can actually tease apart the high vulnerability counties and look at urban, rural, uh, housing density, all kinds of factors that are available on this open access data set and start to identify what are the factors that are putting these communities at risk and then start to try to address those. So I think these are the ways that we can actually work at a granular and local level on these problems. And these are again, open access. California has a similar uh, vulnerability index called HPI. Um, but there are many others. And I think if we can start as academics to I outline what are the specific risk factors in different areas and build toolkits and resources and policies to address them, we can at least start to do the take the first steps in putting out the, the fire in that big burning house. So I will stop there and thank you for your attention. Very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Maldonado. This was really inspiring. Let me turn it over to Franny, who's going to uh, have questions. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll work from there. Thank you so much, Dr. Maldonado, for that. Um, as George said, go ahead and put uh, any questions you have in the Q&A. And just to start off uh, the discussion, Dr. Maldonado, um, where does mortality from COVID-19 in children stack up against other vaccine preventable diseases? And do you anticipate uh, school mandates for COVID-19 vaccines in California? Yeah, so um, I'll ask, answer the second question first. So we know that Dr. Richard Pan, who's a pediatric infectious disease doctor, he's a good friend of George and mine from UC Davis, um, is now a state senator. And he's actually been a big, big champion of vaccination programs and vaccine mandates, um, worked on a number of bills already that have been passed. He's actually proposing a bill to mandate COVID vaccines in schools. So we'll have to see how that goes. Um, I know he's working on it now, but if this becomes a routine endemic disease that we need to vaccinate against, it should be just like all the other vaccine preventable diseases, the 17 that we already have recommended from the ACIP. Now, regarding uh, the cause of, of disease and death, we know that um, last week alone, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics puts out their information on tracking of infections. It's not complete data, obviously, because not everyone gets tested, but last week alone, 1.4 million kids were infected with COVID in one, in one week. So we know that kids are getting infected. Um, people are really discounting the impact of COVID on children. And it is true that like adults, most children um, have asymptomatic or mild disease, but we are seeing tens of thousands of kids who are being hospitalized, uh, not only with COVID that is asymptomatic for other reasons, but are coming into the hospital uh, with infection that is putting them on ventilators. Um, some of the kids have been on ECMO, um, and have been uh, quite ill. Now, about what our understanding is about half of the children have had underlying conditions, immunocompromising conditions or other conditions, but some of those conditions are something like obesity and asthma. Those are the two most common conditions for children who have severe 
um, manifestations. So we do know that the disease has been quite um, Im impacting children. And, um, so, uh, and, and so regarding deaths, um, if you look, and I don't have the slide with me now, but if you look overall at the impact of deaths uh, on COVID-19 deaths in children, uh, we know that COVID right now is the eighth most common cause of death in children in the United States. Now, People might be surprised at that, but that's because children under 18 aren't supposed to die. So if you look at data from JAMA from uh, 2016, we know that about 20,000 people under the age of 18 die every year. So the numbers are relatively small, but um, if you look at the causes of death, most of them are accidents or congenital defects, but COVID-19 is slowly inching its way up that list as more children die from the disease. We know right now that between 1,000 and maybe 1,500 kids have died. When you put that in the context of other infectious diseases, and no other infectious disease even gets close to the top 10. So clearly it is a major cause of not only morbidity, but also mortality relative to other causes. But people start to compare children to the over 65 year olds, and that's not a fair comparison. We don't want children to be dying at the same rate as people over 65. Uh, we want them to stay healthy. And then the last issue is long COVID. We don't have information about long COVID in kids yet. And we, um, we and others have been funded, UCSF as well, to look, there's a study called Recover that looks at long-term sequelae. And we're still in the process of even trying to get a handle on what that means, the definition of long COVID, what kinds of symptoms children and adults have and how long those symptoms will last. But we're definitely seeing kids with longer term symptoms and frighteningly, one of the things that we're finding with kids in particular is that some of the children are presenting with long COVID who didn't even have symptoms when they developed the infection. So um, that's the status now and we're tracking those um, infections over time. Thank you so much. And we have a question in the chat for you, Dr. Maldonado. Um, it says, I saw you quoted the Gates Foundation as saying you can't stop a global pandemic only with a country response. Um, in your opinion, what type of global leadership do you think is needed in strengthening this response? Well, um, yeah, that's a, a, you know, so I've worked for many years on the global polio eradication program, as you may or may not know, um, last year, we saw five cases of wild type polio, and so far this year, we've had none. I'm not actually confident that that's a real number because given the pandemic, we may not be doing uh, adequate surveillance. But the point is, we have dropped quite substantially over the last you know, 30 years. And what we saw with the global polio eradication, as we saw with global smallpox eradication, is that it was, uh, and, and we've seen this from working with WHO and other partners, is that countries don't always have the infrastructure to do the work on their own um, or the political will. So if they're working on one area or another, they may not be able to focus on one disease. Let me give you an example. When we were working on rotavirus vaccine, uh, we knew that rotavirus was the biggest, one of the biggest killers of children in the world, up to 250,000 or more children a year in some countries dying from rotavirus disease. And we had an effective vaccine that was very safe or two vaccines that were safe and effective. But the country a leadership said, look, first of all, the vaccine is expensive. We can't afford it. Secondly, we have other diseases and chronic illnesses and other problems that we have to solve that affect more than 250,000 people a year in our country. So um, we understand that, you know, um, that, governments, ministers of health, ministers of finance have a lot of other issues on their plate. So governments alone cannot do this work. Um, WHO alone can't do it for sure. Um, so it takes multilateral approaches where we like organizations like Gavi, for example, that can provide funding to Gavi eligible countries to be able to afford vaccination and provide infrastructure. WHO could provide technical assistance COVAX, of, of course, now um, to, to be involved, UNICEF, um, and academic institutions provide um, it, as much as they can of the evidence and the um, operational approaches on how best to deal with these issues. So it really does take uh, multiple um, groups 
governmental and non-governmental groups to really get involved in solving these problems. And of course, as we said, it's not just about vaccines, it's about measuring uh, mental health, it's about measuring uh, literacy and all kinds of other issues that were already in, in place before the pandemic and have been exacerbated. So people who are doing other kinds of work need to continue with the lens of what COVID impacts have left behind and how they can be addressed. Thank you so much, Dr. Maldonado. I think that's all we have time for today. I'll turn it over to George to wrap it up, but um, thank you so much for joining us today and for that really thoughtful uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Franny. And thank you very much, uh, Bonnie. It's wonderful to see you, like we do three times a week anyway. Um, <laughs> just to announce uh, on March 9th, we'll be having our next IGHS Grand Rounds, uh, following a pattern we're going to dip down into the Stanford faculty yet again. Uh, and I've invited Dr. Uh, Shuchi Anand, who's a nephrologist at Stanford, uh, who will be talking about chronic kidney disease of unknown uh, etiology, a novel disease uh, uh, invigorates global health investigations in nephrology. So nephrology is kidneys, by the way, in case people didn't know that. But uh, so we'll be looking forward to hearing her. Again, Dr. Maldonado, thanks so much. And uh, uh, it was great to have you. Thank you, Franny, very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.